Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Dane here, Adaptive Exercise and Rehab. In this video, I'll be going over adaptive exercise training principles for quadriplegics. All right, so this video is gonna be detailing all the training priorities for high level and low level quadriplegics. Uh, so basically that's gonna be detailing individuals who have an Asia level of Asia A or Asia B. So that is going to be sensor, motor, uh, sensory and motor complete and motor complete and sensory intact. So individuals who may be able to feel but have, should have no volitional use or should have no volitional use of anything or no sensory ability. So we basically have to make a distinction behind these two training priorities between uh, high level quadriplegic, so that's where we're talking between cervical spine C1 through C4. Uh, and then below that, we're looking at individuals who are a lower level quadriplegic, and that is C5 through C8. Um, so with that distinction, we're looking at individuals who have a massive span of function, but we try to categorize those functionalities into uh, areas that have a little bit more independence, that are the lower quadriplegics, and then uh, areas that have less dependence, uh, less independence rather, and that's high level quadriplegics. Um, so the reason why we make that distinction is high-level quadriplegics typically have, uh, with a C3 through C4 injury, they're having maybe some deltoid and bicep function, but outside of that, there's going to be no tricep, no forearm, and no hand control. Uh, when we're looking below that, so C5 through C8, that's when we start getting tricep function back in play, uh, some forearm control, we have tenodesis of the hand and wrist, some pinching muscles potentially as well then too. Um, and then we have more shoulder and scapular control then as well then too. Um, so with that, that's what we have the massive distinction between with the high level quadriplegics, we're looking at a lot of individuals who are in power wheelchairs uh, and lower level quadriplegics are a lot of individuals who are more so in the manual wheelchair uh, realm. So now that we've distinguished between a high level and a low level quadriplegic, the training priorities behind them are gonna have some similarities and crossover between the two. Um, as blood flow and range of motion are always going to be important regardless of what the injury is um, but it's going to have a greater importance and a greater utility and priority behind um, you know higher level quadriplegics because that's what they get the most out of uh, and that's also what their body allows them to have the most utility with them too uh, so with high level quadriplegics we're looking at circulation of blood flow um, so how we do that is basically by stimulating their legs stimulating their upper body getting them standing, pumping their calves, uh, trying to get blood flow up to their head, their heart, uh, circulating through their bodies that have been ischemic or just have been kind of um, having a lack of blood flow over the past few hours or so or days. Um, outside of that range of motion, like I had mentioned before too, so that's where we're trying to get individuals' hands up over their heads, stretch their chest out. Uh, if you can envision yourself being at a desk for 16 hours a day and then trying to stretch out, you're going to be pretty damn tight. Um, so it's really analogous to that, and that's why stretching is so important for this population. Additionally, too, standing. Standing is obviously a huge priority. That's going to be a priority across every type of individual coming into new ability. Um, that's why we utilize standing frames. That's why we utilize our sit-to-stand machine. That's why we utilize our ceiling lift, things of the sort like that. That allows us to get people standing with um, less weight barrier less, less uh, intensity behind the trainer or on the trainer. Um, outside of that, we're looking to strengthen and, and create longer endurance for some of the pushing muscles, if they have pushing muscles. Um, so a lot of times we're doing modified push-ups and that's where we're looking to try to get basically the shoulders to um, the traps to, um, I guess that would be to retract, or I guess that would be to elevate and then depress them too. So when we're doing push-ups, we're having the person shrug up here, and then they're pushing down, shrug up here, and then pushing down. That also has some motion too in fascial kind of tension lines behind the shoulders and the triceps. So it also helps with that, uh, but also gives them more sense of independence too. Uh, from there, we're looking at scapular movement and stabilization of the scapulas too. Um, so a lot of times we'll have individuals whose scapulas who should be pointed, you know, right around here, their scaps will be pointed right there. And then basically the apex of their scapulas are almost pointing and hitting each other. 
Um, so from there, we basically are trying to bring their shoulders as far forward as they can and protract their scapulas. So we can work on just pure retractions then too. Um, and how we do that is we get them in the chest supported row machine, put their active hands on, stretch them forward, and then put the machine in place and then have them work through rows. And we can also do that with you know artificial means of FES through stimulation through their rhomboids and then their biceps and then their posterior deltoids also. Um, pain reduction also too, so a lot of nerve pain can come up. Um, that typically what I've seen is usually in the lower legs, sometimes in the hands, sometimes in the butt. Um, it's all over the place. So uh, with that, a you know blood flow and stimulation, uh, some type of movement is going to help with that um, because it's a putting a stimulus on something that hasn't had a stimulus over the past few x amount of time uh, additionally with that too we also have a power plate down there off to your right and then we also have a power plate over here to also um, that also desperately helps uh, limit nerve pain also too as it's basically replacing the lack of stimulation with a stimulus uh, and then kind of upbreaking the nervous system too Another thing that we do with the power plates also is lymphatic drainage. So if we ever have any edema that's kind of forming through the lower extremities, we're able to put a person on the power plate and that's able to help stimulate lymphatic drainage and basically bring the lymph back up to the heart and spread it back to the areas that um, it's a little more distributed equally to instead of having gravity just push it down to the lower limbs. Um, and then hands and feet range of motion too. Again, that's what we do with the power plate. So we're doing ankles, um, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, inversion, and eversion. But we also have something called the Galileo Mono, uh, which is a dumbbell that's analogous to like a power plate dumbbell. Um, and that basically is gonna help kind of open up the forearm, but also it can help if you have somebody who's abled body can help stimulate more muscle activity in the upper arms and the arms in general. Uh, that's really important also. Um, so making the distinction between high level quadriplegics and low level quadriplegics, arguably everything that I said in that first portion of high level quadriplegics will still be analogous and still be uh, of utility for lower level quadriplegics, but it won't be as much of a priority and you can also build on that quite a bit too. Um, so with low level quadriplegics, you're looking at individuals who have some upper arms, some motion of their chest and neck, um, some upper of their arms also too. Um, so standing and kneeling, uh, tall kneeling, half kneeling, different positions, getting a person is super, super important. Um, outside of that, upon getting a person standing, can we go ahead and get you your cardiovascular system pumping now too? Can we go ahead and do the arm bike upon standing? Can we do the glider upon standing right now? Uh, what's gonna weigh that? What's a way that's for us to get your heart rate up, uh, get your um, you know your cardiovascular system pumping? And going and being able to get you the most out of this um, this workout then too uh, but also I always try to get endorphins too I want that good feeling after a workout too so you want to push them as much as possible um, outside of uh, standing we're looking at seated core stabilization too so we can get them right at the edge of the table have their feet planted down at the edge and then have them trying to stabilize um, in position uh, sometimes if we're feeling a little wonky a little crazy we'll give them a dowel and then we'll have them start kind of doing some throws and hits and trying to get some coordination while trying to maintain balance at the stability point then. Uh, pushing and pulling strength output is absolutely huge. Uh, we have a dip rickshaw machine behind us too. We have a hammer strength pull machine off to the right over there too. Uh, both of those are huge for um, the pressing wheelchair propulsion output, but also for pulling also from there. Um, both of those are absolutely huge, but again, it uses everything that that client has to offer uh, to utilize those muscles and be able to get the most out of them. Uh, shoulder and scapular health and stability too. So when we're looking at lower level quadriplegics, they're gonna have some scapular movement, some rotator cuff activation, some rhomboid activation potentially too. Um, so that's why again, getting their hands up over their head, lat pull downs, assisted pull ups, um, cross body pulls, things are gonna move their scapulas outside of that typical internal rotation position that they're at when they're on their chair. And something that's gonna counteract that internal rotation that they get when they're pressing a manual chair as well too. So getting them externally rotated, working on some postural support. And um, that leads me into the next one too, is working on postural support, being able to basically extend right through the areas that they need, uh, and then being able to support through areas that the training staff can really kind of come into play and add some utility and value in also. 
Um, outside of that, lower extremity muscle stimulation and activation too. So that's where we get to utilize our FES systems. Um, so this is where we can stimulate a person's quads, core, glutes, and that way we can basically press go, have them stand straight on up, and then they can start using what they have for volition. So they can start pressing into motions, they can start pulling into motions. Um, and that also kind of really helps lead us into getting them efficiently onto the FES bike then too. If you already have pads in position, it should be an easy, easy flow for us. Uh, some individuals based off of, uh, you know, how long that they've been injured for have a priority of doing gait training. Um, even with them having a high level injury, uh, or I should say a lower level quadriplegic injury, but having an Asia level of an Asia A or an Asia B, being able to get up and get walking and get eye level with other folks and having that normality of seeing your legs move just feels good sometimes too. Um, so sometimes that's a training priority, but I can't ever say that that's too high on my training priority list. Um, because I want to emphasize what they can do and what they can use for themselves by themselves um, and then how I can assist them in the ways that bring value most to them too. Um, outside of those areas, we know we're obviously looking to prevent atrophy, osteoporosis, and then secondary health complications too. Um, you know, preventing skin sores, preventing heterotopic ossifications, preventing uh, the onset of autonomic dysreflexia. Those are always huge, huge, huge things for individuals living with paralysis. Um, so those are always underlying kind of things that we're trying to emphasize and trying to be conscious of. Um, but overall, that's, that's kind of some of the training priorities for a high level quadriplegic and then a low level quadriplegic. How there's similarities behind them too. And then how with a low level quadriplegic, you can take those similarities and really expand on them quite a bit and really use everything that that client has to offer too. Um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to leave comments on the video. Uh, if you guys like the content, please feel free to give a thumbs up too and subscribe if you like to. Catch you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching.